Bom, muito bom dia novamente a todas e todos aqui presentes. Nós vamos iniciar a sexta conferência FAPESP de 2023, Evolução Humana, Conquistas e Desafios, que será proferida pelo professor Bernard Wood. E o evento de hoje é um evento especial porque temos a parceria do Museu de Arqueologia e Etnologia e do Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP. Então, para compor a mesa, eu gostaria de convidar o professor Carlos Jolie, da Unicamp, que está representando o presidente da Fundação, o professor Marco Antônio Zago, que cumpre a agenda externa. Professor Fernando Ferreira Costa, que é professor da Unicamp e coordenador das conferências, da Comissão das Conferências FAPESP. Nosso parceiro na conferência de hoje, professor Walter Neves, do Instituto de Biociências da USP. Perdão, corrigindo, do Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP. Muito obrigado. E com muita satisfação, convido para compor a mesa o Dr. Bernard Wood, nosso conferencista de hoje. Professor Jolie, por gentileza, a palavra está com o senhor. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Obrigado é, pela presença. É, a FAPESP, o Museu de Arqueologia e Etnologia da USP e o Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP, é, tem o prazer está recebendo o professor Bernard Wood, é, como é de praxe nas conferências da FAPESP que estamos fazendo, é, eu vou passar para o inglês. Professor Bernard Wood is University Professor of Human Origins at George Washington University, and since 68 has been working in this field, joined Richard Leakey's first expedition to the Turkana base in Kenya, just to remember that uh, it was there that they found the Turkana boy that is uh, an is almost complete uh, skeleton of a uh, young Homo erectus. And he subsequently joined the group of researchers working on the hominids recovered from East Turkana. He has published more than 250 referred scientific articles and book chapters and more than 100 articles and commentaries. He's the author of, or co-author of, 20 books with uh, special attention to the one that's not technical. It's a book that is written for the public in general, that is Human Evolution, a very short introduction. And he's also the editor of the Encyclopedia of Human Evolution. He's best known for his research on the origins of Homo, and his research has been cited more than 20,000 times. Uh, today, we are going to have uh, this uh, conference, Human Evolution Achievements and Challenges. And uh, there is sound evidence that chimpanzees and bonobos, bonobos are a pygmy chimpanzee, are more closely related to modern humans than they are to gorillas. And there is less sound, but still good, evidence that modern humans shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos or about 8 million years ago. So there must have been at the minimum a sequence of ancestors and descendants providing a link between us and that common ancestor. And that is what Professor Bernard Wood is going to tell us today. Professor Wood, the floor is yours. I'm so sorry, Julie. Uh, Professor Walter, please, you have the floor. Yes. Eu vou falar em português mesmo. 
é, como eu disse ontem lá na USP, faz 30 anos que eu tento trazer o Bernard Wood para o Brasil, e mais dado a agenda cheíssima que ele tem, só agora ele pode, ele pode atender o nosso, o nosso convite. E, e, e o Bernard Wood, eu acho que se houvesse... É, ele acabou de ganhar um prêmio internacional da Royal Society of Anthropology. É, e se houvesse um prêmio Nobel na nossa área, certamente ele já o teria ganho. Né? É, tudo que o Bernard publicou se tornou clássico. Então é impossível estudar né, os primeiros passos da evolução. Ele, 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 ele trabalha num período de tempo mais ou menos entre 7 milhões de anos e, e 1 milhão de anos atrás, e a especialidade dele é a questão da origem do gênero homo, né? não confundir com a origem do homo sapiens, que é uma outra coisa. Né? Então, a especialidade dele é a origem do gênero homo. Como eu disse, ele é a pessoa de referência nessa área e a vinda dele aqui, né, custeada pelo Instituto de Estudos Avançados e pelo Museu de Arqueologia e Etnologia da USP, é, basicamente veio atender três demandas. Né? Primeiro, essas duas conferências, ontem uma na USP, hoje uma aqui na FAPESP, como não podia deixar de ser, não é? É, ele também está orientando alunos brasileiros do meu grupo de trabalho e é, vamos, a partir de amanhã, efetuar uma a viagem de campo para a região de Lagoa Santa, de onde saiu a famosa Luzia que me tirou do anonimato. Né? E que eu chamo de o berço da arqueologia Uh, brasileira. Então, o professor Bernard Wood vai estar envolvido uh, nessas três atividades. Muito obrigado. Uh, obrigado, professor Walter, por essas uh, complementar essas informações. Eu estive pessoalmente em Lagoa Santa várias vezes e acho toda vez que eu vou é, é, é uma nova descoberta. Tenho certeza que o professor Wood vai é, aproveitar muito essa viagem de campo. Não, professor Wood. The floor is yours. While they are relocating, I just want to express my thanks to the foundation for the support for my visit. And to Walter Nevis, who, who, who was extremely patient. And I gather, I gather from his friends that actually patience is not one of his great qualities, but um, which is the reason why he man has managed to achieve so much. So I want to talk to you today about what has been achieved in the the scientific enterprise of trying to reconstruct our evolutionary history and some of the challenges that I think are, are still to be met. Um, 1966 may be an odd um, date to start, but it's when I took a course, I was a medical student And I took a course at the University of London in human evolution. And uh, the, the course interested me because I enjoyed anatomy and human evolution or the, re or the reconstruction of human evolutionary history is largely through the interpretation of the fossil evidence and that And that interpretation requires some, some anatomical knowledge. When I did a course in primatology in 1966 with, uh, with John Napier, um, it was still conventional wisdom 
that modern humans were so different from the the apes that we were in our own family the hominidae which meant that we were called hominids and the apes were in their own family called the pongidae and so they were called pongids and in 1966 the um what we knew about human evolution is reflected in this diagram and and you will see a diagram a version of this diagram several times in the talk on the left hand side the vertical axis is millions of years and the horizontal axis is a rather informal axis with organisms like modern humans with a large brain on the left and um, the uh, the species of early hominins with very large molar and um, very large chewing teeth on the right each of the columns represent a taxon that was recognized then the the bottom of each column is represents the the first appearance date in other words the earliest evidence of that taxon now we know not necessarily in 1966 so if this diagram had been uh, been constructed in 1966 the heights and the lengths of the columns would be different but nonetheless there would be columns so that was what was known in 19 66 the there are there are a couple of taxa which are highlighted they are they're in bold on the diagram um, and they're in bold because they had only recently been discovered the um, the leakies mary leakie on the left and lewis leakie on the right had discovered what they called Zinjanthropus boisei in 1959. And then they had um, discovered what was called Homo habilis in 1964. And the person who, um, the professor who gave the course in human evolution was a man called Michael Day. And he had been involved with the analysis of some of the fossils belonging to Homo habilis. And so for my project, my BSc project, and of course, when you're an undergraduate, you have no idea what your professors do when they're not actually talking to you. You do not have the first idea of what they do. Um, and so I had really no clue about Michael's involvement in the Olduvai fossils. But for my Bachelor of Science degree, you had to do a project and so michael day he gave me the uh, the talus the the bone in the foot that uh, that connects with the leg he gave me the talus and he said you work on that and of course i had not no idea that i was the first person who had ever been able to work on this uh, because you, as an undergraduate you're completely clueless um, and so I and so I did a project, and, and and Michael Day and I wrote a paper about the Olduvai eight tailors, and we used a new form of analysis then called multivariate analysis. And I hadn't realized that nobody had ever applied this sort of analysis to to uh, to early hominin bones. So. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that I was extremely fortunate, even though I didn't appreciate it at the time. So now that diagram looks like this. And this is a very specious interpretation of human, human evolutionary history. And the diagram looks like this because we now have evidence that 
those are the green ones here and the um oh, I'm sorry I shouldn't be allowed anywhere near anything to do with technology okay the um can we go back one I'm sorry, one more. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, okay. Um, so the, 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 um, the green ones in the bottom right are taxa that might be what we now call hominins, and I'll explain why we no longer call them hominids, but hominins. Um, the, the brown taxa on the right are the creatures with really large premolar and molar teeth. And um, your, the crown of your first mandibular molar is about the size of the, uh, the uh, nail on your little finger. These guys have molars that are about the size of the nail on your thumb. So these guys have really large chewing teeth. The orange ones are the species in the genus Australopithecus, which, which was proposed by Raymond Dart in, in 1925. The, uh, the blue ones are creatures with not necessarily brains as big as ours, but, but, but limb proportions which are much like ours. In other words, they didn't have very long, long arms and short legs. They had longer legs and less long arms. And then we're in red on the top left. The other thing that's happened now that hadn't happened in, in 1966 is that we know a lot more about the relationships between modern humans and the apes. And you can see in this diagram, it's a very different diagram. And it's very different because it has some relationships on it. Um, it has the common, chimpan the common chimpanzees and the bonobos, and you can see that, th that the difference in their DNA um, suggests that they, they had a common ancestor a couple of million years ago. And that's the same for the gorillas. The... the um, the main species of orangutans probably split about one million years ago. The differences in the DNA of the common chimpanzees and the bonobos on the one hand and modern humans on the other hand, they are such that it's probable that the most recent common ancestor of modern, of modern humans and bonobos and common chimpanzees lived maybe around 8 million years ago, maybe as recently as 6 million years ago, but some people think it's a little older. And of course, this is not a precise sort of estimate because you have to make all sorts of assumptions about mutation rates and lifespan and so on and so forth. So that is... Um, so the reason that I'm going to call what I used to call when I was a student hominids, I'm going to call them hominins, is because they are not so different from the apes. And so to have a family for modern humans is no longer justified. And so we have either a tribe or a subtribe. The name of the subtribe is much more difficult to say, so I'm going to spare myself and call them hominins, which is the, the informal term for the tribe hominini. So when I'm at a party uh, that I can't avoid going to, um, and people say, what do you do? Um, I say, I try and work out what happened between the common ancestor of modern humans and bonobos and common chimpanzees and, um, and modern humans. In other words, I try and work out what's going on in the red line, which is, which is enclosed by the yellow line. 
Um, and that's what I've been doing for since really on and off since 1966 because Richard Leakey, Michael Day managed to get me an invitation to go and work with Richard Leakey in 1968. I went back to medical school after that. I did surgery for a while, but eventually I stopped doing surgery and, and spent my time either, either trying to teach um, medical students anatomy or surgeons in that, or anatomy to surgeons, but my research has always been in, in what we call paleoanthropology. So, so when their eyes glaze over, because I've been talking about bonobos and common chimpanzees and modern humans, uh, and they say, well, I don't quite understand. I say, well, I'm trying to improve our understanding of human evolution. Um, that's what I used to say. What I say now is that I try and reduce our ignorance about human evolution. And it seems to me that, that we should err on the side that we're trying to be less ignorant rather than more knowledgeable. So let's go back to the more positive spin on this. Um, so how do you do that? Well, the answer is you get more evidence. It's how you do anything. If you want to investigate anything, you need to get more evidence. You need to get more data. So where does that evidence come from? Well, it can be because you find more fossil evidence or more molecular evidence. When I was a student, the only access you had to human evolutionary history was via the fossil record. Now you can recover ancient DNA. You can get information from ancient DNA. And if I was asked, if I had been accused of a crime and there was genetic evidence that I had nothing to do with the crime, or there was somebody who could, who could identify me and say that I wasn't there, my sense is that I would opt for the genetic evidence that I wasn't there because it's a lot more reliable than somebody's impression of what I look like. So the genetic evidence is very powerful, but it only goes back at the moment to about 430,000 years. So if you remember the diagram and the millions of years on the column on the left, that only takes you back to a really small proportion of human evolution. So, so for most of human evolutionary history, we have to rely on the fossil record. We can't rely on uh, the molecules. Um, you can find new fossils, but you can also squeeze more information out of the fossil evidence that you already have. And there are various ways that you can do that, and I will, and I will speak about those later. <clears throat> you can also come up with new methods of analysis of the fossil record, or you can improve existing methods of analyzing the fossil record. Now, somewhere in my desk, is a file card that has this on it. And basically, if I'm not doing any of those things, I'm not working. And, and when graduate students, um, when they decide on their thesis topic, we agree that sort of flow chart for their thesis topic. And I say to them, if you're not doing anything that's on the index card, you're not working. That's fine, but just make sure that you understand that you're not working on your thesis. Um, so what about the more fossils? Well, this was a fossil um, 
KNM stands for Kenya National Museum. East Rudolph stands for um, the name of the lake. Um, used to be Lake Rudolph, but in 1975, its name was changed, but they didn't change the designation of the fossils. And so KNM ER. 1470 was a cranium that was found in 1972. The mandible, which is in the picture, was found much later. Now, the mandible doesn't belong to the same individual as the cranium. I'm going to take my jacket off, if you will excuse me. Uh, the mandible doesn't belong to the same individual as the cranium, but it's probably belongs to the same species. And so that is an example of more evidence. So we didn't know what the mandible of that species looked like. We had the cranium, but we didn't have the mandible. And a cranium plus a mandible is a skull. So that's one of the reasons, more fossil evidence is one of the reasons why there are so many more columns on that diagram today than there were in 1966. The molecular evidence began with the recovery by a group led by Svante Pabo, who won the Nobel Prize last year, um, and this was work done by a postdoc of his, Matthias Krinks, and they managed to recover DNA from one of the limb bones of the Neanderthal skeleton, the type skeleton of Homo neanderthalensis. That was only in 1997. So a huge amount has happened since then that was reflected in the award of the Nobel Prize to Svante. So you can, you can get more information to reduce our ignorance from the molecular evidence, but it doesn't help me. It doesn't help me because I lose interest in human evolutionary history once we start to look like modern humans. And that is about 300,000 years ago. So, it's really helpful for the people who are interested in the evolution of modern humans and Neanderthals and such, but that's, that's not my bag. So what about extracting additional information from the, uh, the fossil record? Well, the, the, you can do this now in very fancy ways. You can take fossils to uh, the synchrotron in Europe, um, at CERN, uh, the synchrotron has, um, has extremely powerful, it's extremely powerful, and you can get all sorts of information. You can actually, <coughs> you can get information about the microstructure of the teeth using the synchrotron. It's so powerful. And the first use of, of, of x-rays to, to look at a fossil hominin was way back in the early 1900s. There was some use of it for the, um, the, the material that we now put in Homo erectus that was found at what used to be called Tukutian and is now called Zugudian in China. And some of those fossils were radiographed. And so when we were trying to work out we were interested not just in the crowns of the teeth, in other words, the white things that are in your mouth, but we were also interested in the roots of the teeth, which is how the teeth are retained in your jaw. Modern humans have relatively simple roots, um, but the, the fossil hominins, the few teeth that have both a crown and a root, and weren't embedded in jaws, it was clear that their root morphology was more complex. But we wanted to get access 
to the roots of teeth that were still in the mandible or were still in the maxilla. So when we were at the National Museum in Kenya, we managed to get an old x-ray machine from Nairobi Hospital. And we thought we would have a go at seeing if we could take x-rays. I was it hurts me to say x-ray because I was taught to say radiographs because you can't see x-rays, okay? And there are physicists in the room. And so if I said that is an x-ray, they would just look at me as if I was completely daft. It's not an x-ray, it's a radiograph. So we struggled with this and we were getting nowhere. And so because the fossils have nobody issuing them with a badge measuring how much radioactivity they have, a, they have absorbed. I said, why don't we turn all the knobs up to maximum and go and have a cup of tea? And when we came back, and you're not going to believe this, that was the radiograph that, that eventually um, we developed and we could see. So the answer is it took a lot of energy and a lot of time. But the great thing about fossils is that they don't move. So in other words, you know, if you go and have a radiograph and they say, take a deep breath, and hold it, and stay still. Well, you know, you just say to the fossil, it's fine. <laughs> just, just don't move. And the fossil does exactly what you tell them. So, so that showed us that the roots of the teeth of these very hypermegadont creatures were as complicated as the crowns. And that was really interesting information because roots develop in a very predictable way. And so you can come up with a pretty good hypothesis about what the primitive condition of root morphology is and what the derived condition of root morphology is. And that is very useful. When I was a student, the only thing you, that, that you could do to record information about teeth was to measure how long they were and how wide they were. And if you were very sophisticated, you could m measure width in two places. Okay. So, so, that, so that's all we could do. And, I was, and my daughter was very interested in the Guinness Book of Records. And um, so we were reading, or I was looking at the Guinness Book of Records one evening, and I discovered that the largest aircraft hangar at London Airport was more or less the same ground, more or less the same square footage as St. Peter's um, Basilica in Rome. So, that, so I thought, wow. So all we're doing with these teeth is we're measuring their square footage. We're not collecting any information about what was in that square footage. So we started to get very sophisticated and measure the areas of each of the cusps. And that gave us much more information than just how long they were and how wide they were. But nowadays, you can actually collect information much more precisely and you can do it because you can use micro CT, so you can actually make slices, virtual slices through teeth. You can extract, you can demarcate the enamel from the dentin, and then you can use 3D geometric morphometrics to locate landmarks on the dentin, because even if the enamel is worn, quite a lot of teeth, the wear doesn't extend into the dentin. So if you can virtually remove the enamel cap, you can actually look at the morphology of the dentin, the surface of the dentin. And that's what Matt Skinner, who was a graduate student, um, has done here. And you can see on the right, where it's labeled the EDJ, you can see the landmarks, which I think are yet uh, are red, and then the sliding semi-landmarks, which are yellow. 
you don't actually sort of do this, but you can get the computer to say there is a curve between the landmarks. What you do is that you have you distribute 20 sliding land, landmarks along that curve, and they're equidistant from each other. And then you locate where they are in three dimensions. And this gives you much more precise information about morphology than you could, you could possibly capture in any other way. The other way that we are squeezing more information out of the existing fossil record is using what are called stable isotopes. And stable isotopes, such as carbon, they, um, different sorts of plants have different sorts of metabolism. And that metabolism is reflected in levels of stable isotopes. So the leaves of plants are more C3, and grass is more C4. It's a lot more complicated than that, but, but, but just humor me. So um, you can also get an idea about what the vegetation was like from stable isotopes in, in fossil soils. So you can take the geologist will say, you know, this is a fossil soil. So you take a sample of the fossil soil and you look at the stable isotopes. And you can see, and this is David Patterson, who was another graduate student. Um, he looked at a whole bunch of what are called paleosols, which is a fossil soil. Um, he looked at a whole bunch of those. And, and across about a million years, there was a slight change in the vegetation as expressed in the stable isotopes, but nothing, nothing very dramatic. When you look at the stable isotopes in the enamel of the teeth of fossil hominins, if you can persuade the museum curators to let you drill a little hole in the teeth and you collect the dust and you can measure the stable isotopes in the dust, you can get an idea of what the stable isotopes of those individuals were. Now, let me make it clear that we all know that we don't continue to develop our teeth through our adulthood. So basically, the stable isotopes collected from a tooth, like an M1, reflect what that individual was eating while it was laying down the enamel of its M1. That means it's reflecting what they were eating when they were, when they were a child. It's not what they were eating when they were an adult. If you want to get closer to what they were eating when they were, were an adult, you look at the M3 because that develops later. So it's important that you remember that. What David found was that for something like Paranthropus boisei, which is what we now call Zingantropus boisei, um, they, that had a C4 signal for the whole of the time that it's recorded in the Chakana Basin. It starts out as a C4 signal and it ends as a C4 signal. The early homo that that I'm nearly as interested in early Homo as I am in Paranthropus boisei. The reason I'm interested in Paranthropus boisei is because hardly anybody else is interested in Paranthropus boisei. Why is hardly anybody else interested in Paranthropus boisei? Because it's pretty clear that Paranthropus boisei was not an ancestor of modern humans, which for a lot of people makes it less interesting. For me, it actually makes it more interesting because it was living at the same time as creatures that are more likely to be our ancestors. So if you look at if you look at Homo, the early Homo, which is probably Homo habilis, was more C3, and the later Homo is more C4. So it's actually more like 
It's more like Paranthropus boisei, but it doesn't have the large chewing teeth of Paranthropus boisei. So it was really not equipped at all to eat the sorts of things that we think Paranthropus boisei was eating. So why does it shift from C3 to C4? Well, we don't know that there's a sporting chance is because it was beginning to eat meat. And if you eat the meat of creatures that were eating C4 grass, you inherit their signal. And that's as, it's as simple as that. So we think that probably reflects a change in behavior between something like Homo habilis and something like Homo erectus or Homo ergaster. So what about new and improved analy um, the analytical methods? I've already talked about this, really. This is what, a, this is what an early hominin tooth or teeth look like. You can see these are molars. These are mandibular molars. And the, the occlusal surface is broken into cusps. The, there, are, there are areas that are... There are um, that are demarcated by the fissures. And as I told you, we thought we were being extremely smart because we were measuring width in two places and not just one. But that still doesn't really allow you to capture a lot of morphology. We thought we were really, really smart when we were measuring the areas of the cusps. And when we were looking at using what was then a newfangled method to look at the shape of the base of the crown. Uh, but now, using the method that you saw with the picture of Matt Skinner, who was micro CTing a tooth, now we can capture this sort of information. And that information, um, one of the things Matt did for his PhD was to look at some chimpanzees and you can see there is a yellow, the yellow balls are trying to reflect what, what we call the ridge curve. And the, and the green balls are trying to reflect what we call the base curve. In other words, that's the shape of the base and the shape of the ridge on the dentine. The, uh, the dentine. So when you look at all the ridge curves, this is what it looks like. And when you look at all the the base curves, this is what it looks like. And that's the average ridge curve. And you can see that there is not a lot of noise in those data. You know, the ridge curves are all pretty similar. And that allows you to, um, to capture information that you just really can't capture using um, less, less intensive methods for capturing morphology. So that, um, so the combination of more fossils, squeezing more information about the existing fossils, and and improving the the methods allows you to capture more evidence, and that more evidence is reflected in the in the columns in the the diagram. So what about the challenges? Um, one challenge is actually how many columns there are in that bag. And you can see that there are lots of columns here. And it's called, um, it's according to a splitter's taxonomy. In other words, it's a very specios interpretation of the hominin fossil record. If there was a choice between saying this is one species which is highly variable or saying this sample now is too variable, shows too much variation, um, not variability, too much variation to be explained by just being one species, then you say there are two species and that makes you a splitter and so you come up with more columns. Now, um, 
A lot of my colleagues, this makes them extremely irritated that there are so many columns, okay? But nonetheless, it always seems to be much easier to fuse columns together than to take fewer species and try and work out how to split them. So, so even though there are lots of columns in that diagram, might there be even more? In other words, are there early hominin species which are yet to be discovered? And there are reasons why there might be um, there might be more species because the the parts of Africa where there are fossil sites where we find fossil hominins reflect a very small proportion of the land surface of Africa, and the reason that you find fossils in a place is because of geological contingency. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the you know the whether that place was the world headquarters of that of that species. It's just that you find fossils there. Um, so there are reasons why there might be even more species and there are undiscovered species. Uh, there are reasons why that species interpretation may be what we call over-egging the pudding. In other words, you are you are you are sort of assuming there are, you know, you, you're assuming there, there are more taxa than there actually are. So just in order for me to try and explain this, just if you could just humor me and sort of join me in a thought experiment. Now, my ability to make images on slides is really not well developed. So so I'm into circle here, okay. And I'm going to assume the average length of time of a mammalian species in the fossil record is about a million years. So I'm going to assume that, that a fossil hominin has about a million years of time. We don't know what the range of early hominins was because we only have fossil sites in very few locations. But I'm going to assume it's the same sort of range as say one of the species of baboons or one of the species of grenons, which means it's probably a couple of sort of thousand miles. So, so the circles represent a species scattered through a million years and across a couple of thousand miles of space. They aren't all the same, because living animals are not all the same through time or through space, but they are recognizable, they are distinctive. So the circle is the distinctive part of it. Some of them are dark gray because maybe they're larger, some of them are light gray because maybe they're smaller. Um, and, and they're sort of, you know, I've just sort of distributed them across, across time and space. But the point I want to make is that a taxon through a million years of time is not always going to be the same. It's going to be recognizable, but it's not always going to be the same. It's like the people in this room. You're all recognizable as modern humans, but you're not the same not the same stature, um, you don't have the same size teeth and so on, so there is a difference. And you can imagine this room through a million years, you know, is going to change. So, somebody gets money from a, from a foundation as, as generous as this one, and they go and they recover uh, some fossil evidence of this taxon, okay? So they, so they go to a site and uh, the taxon uh, and they recover the fossil evidence. They know how old it is, the earliest remains at that site, and they know the most recent remains at that site. So they know its first appearance date, which is the bottom. They know its last appearance date, which is the top. And they know that it was present at that site. 
They don't know it wasn't present in other places, but they have no evidence that it was present in that place. So that's a site sample of the population, which are the gray circles of different shade and different size. This foundation is so amazed by the success of the first expedition that it gives money for a second expedition. And so they go and they discover more evidence of the same creature, the large light gray circles. It's the same species, yes. Um, it's now known to be earlier, okay, and in a slightly different place, but it's now known to be earlier. And the foundation is so delighted by the success of the second one that it sends a third expedition and they find um, also evidence of large light gray circles. It's the same species, yes, in a slightly different place. And because it's between the the first appearance date and the last appearance date, it's not contributing any more information about the, you know, the temporal span of the species. Then another expedition, and it goes to a different place. And it finds some creatures, but they're not all large gray circles. There are some small gray circles. And, you know, they could say, hey, our fossil hominins are slightly different from the fossil hominins that are found in site A, B, and C. Therefore, we have found a new species. Okay? You and I know it's the same species. It's just found at a slightly different place in a slightly different time. So, they don't think it's the same species because it's different you know, the teeth are slightly different in size or the cranium is slightly different in shape than the existing site samples. Um, and they say it's a new species and it has a new range and it has a new first, it has a new first appearance date and a new last appearance date. You and I know that that's not true. Um, but, uh, you and I know that it's the same species. So what you have to do when you find fossil hominins is not jump up and down when you discover there are differences between your site sample and the existing site samples, but you have to ask yourself, what is the probability that these site samples could have all been sampled from the same population? That's a very different question. And it's not a question, just, just confide in you, it's not a question that, that my colleagues very often ask. They are much more concerned about the differences than the possibility that the site samples could all have been sampled from the same population. So that affects the number of species that you might recognize in the hominin fossil record. So even if you're very, very parsimonious and you recognize very few species, then this is the minimum number of species you can recognize. That's still quite a lot, but that's the bare minimum, okay? And I think it's an unrealistically small number of species. So, so how many taxa is a difficult problem? Where were hominins living? That's also a difficult problem for reasons I've already talked to you about, because these are the only places where we find early hominins. Once you get to Homo, you find them in, also in North Africa, and there may be early hominins in North Africa. So, I'm just asking you to think, do you think if those are the only places in Africa that we have sampled, we are likely to have captured evidence of every early, early hominin that lived on the African continent? And the answer is no. 
I mean, I'm sure we're missing some. The when question is also a little difficult because the first appearance date, which is the, uh, the red broken column on the left, and the last appearance date, which is the red broken column on the right, the confidence that they represent the first evidence of that hominin taxon on the planet, or the last evidence of that hominin taxon on the planet, depends on a bunch of things. It mainly depends on how many fossil sites there are earlier than your first appearance date. Because if there are none, then your first appearance date is not terribly reliable. But if there are five fossil sites within half a million years of your first appearance date, and there is evidence of mammals, but not of your particular hominin taxon, then your first appearance date has a, has a smaller confidence interval than if there were no fossil sites, in which case it would have a larger confidence interval. And the confidence intervals are the, the, uh, the, uh, the curves which are over each of the, uh, the first and last appearance dates. And this is, this is a sort of a diagram reflecting um, in other words, in the top, in A, if those are the only, if those are the only fossil sites, then the, the confidence intervals are going to be large. If you look at B, where there are more fossil sites, then the confidence interval will be smaller. And we did that for uh, for Australopithecus anamensis afarensis, which is likely to be a lineage. And you can see that the confidence intervals for the first appearance date are uh, the whisker at the left-hand end and the confidence intervals for the last appearance date are the whisker at the, at the right-hand end. And the reason I'm going into this is because there has been a tendency to take those columns, the first and last appearance date, and to look for wiggles in the oxygen isotopes which indicates some change in paleoclimate and say, wow, that wiggle corresponds to the bottom, you know, to the origin of, of Australopithecus afarensis. Therefore, paleoclimate was the reason for us. That's nonsense because that's probably not when it originated. It's when its first appearance date, but that's, that's unlikely to be when it originated. So, so those columns, there is something missing from those diagrams with the columns. And something missing are lines connecting them. And the lines would be hypotheses about relationships. And so we have to ask ourselves a question, does our little sort of twig of the tree of life just consist of ancestors of modern humans, or do we also have non-ancestral close relatives, okay? Now, just to illustrate this point, I'm going to share some of my family history, not our family history, my family history. This is my great-grandparents' golden wedding. Okay. My father's, um, my father's, um, it's actually my father's mother's parents. And um, on the left is my father's father, who is, um, um, who is a relative. Um, standing up is my father. Sitting down is a relative. She's my aunt Kitty. And then um, next to my father is his mother. And then uh, the, uh, the, um, my, my paternal grandmother's parents, whose golden wedding it was. So they're all my relatives. Yeah. They're all my relatives. Um, with the exception of Aunt Kitty, they're all my ancestors in one, you know, one form or another, one generation or another. So, so the ratio of ancestors to close relatives is heavily in favor of ancestors. 
Here is my christening, okay? That's me being held by my godfather. The ones marked R are my relatives. My relatives who are my ancestors are now the minority. Most of the people in my christening photograph who are my relatives, who are my relatives, are my close relatives, they're not necessarily my ancestors. And the question we have to ask is this diagram more like my great grandparents golden wedding or is it more like my christening in other words are most of the creatures in this diagram ancestors in which case this can be difficult because there are some some times when there is more than one hominin the question is which is my ancestor and then or are they um or are the majority close relatives with only a minority being ancestors um, it's almost certain that it's more like my christening than it is my, my, my great-grandparents' golden wedding. Then you say, okay, so how do you tell ancestors from, um, from close relatives? The answer is with enormous difficulty. Because we don't have a lot of evidence, we only have scraps of the body, and those sort of scraps of the body don't always tell you a lot of information about relationships. Why, why did modern humans evolve? Why did all those hominins evolve? Way above my pay grade. Why questions are way above my pay grade. Um, we don't know. You know, I mean, you know, some people think it's paleoclimate, some people think it's this or that. We really don't know. And if anybody tries to persuade you that they do know, um, you need to take it with a pinch of salt. So, um, back to me having, a, having an awkward conversation at a party, that's what I try and do to reduce our ignorance about the red line in the yellow box. I just want to express some, some debts I owe to people who gave me enormous opportunities. One of them was the co-leader of the Kubi Flora Research Project, an archaeologist called Glenn Isaac, who was an absolutely wonderful guy. He was an archaeologist he was really an evolutionary biologist and he used archaeological evidence to try and recover information about human behavior about early human behavior that's the way he looked at it okay that's the way he looked at it he died far too young and 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 i owe glenn an, an enormous debt the guy on the left here, Kamoya Camus, was Richard, Richard's right-hand man in running the Kubi Flora Research Project. And um, he died last year. And Kamoya was immensely kind to me. And, um, and um, he was the one who really sort of ran things. And if you didn't take any notice of what Kamoya said, you were a blithering idiot. Okay. <laughs> Because Kamaya was essentially telling you, even if Richard wasn't there, he was telling you, he had Richard's authority. And if you started to, you know, to argue the toss with Kamaya, you weren't long for, uh, you know, you were quite soon on the next plane back to Nairobi. I also want to thank Meve, who is still alive, because when she worked with Richard, she was, um, she was very influential and and helped me. But lastly, I want to thank Richard Leakey, who, who died last year, who gave me my opportunity to get into paleoanthropology. And, and for that, I will be eternally grateful. Lastly, in the middle of the Second World War, when things were going really, really badly, Neville Chamberlain, who was the person who 
went to see Hitler, who sort of came back and said, you know, I have an agreement with Herr Hitler and everything's going to be okay. Neville Chamberlain died. Winston Churchill had replaced Neville, Neville Chamberlain as the prime minister. And Winston Churchill, in the middle of very bad times in 1940, when it wasn't clear that Germany wasn't going to be successful, gave a tribute to Neville Chamberlain in the House of Commons. And he said, history with its flickering lamp stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes, and kindle with the pale gleams the passion of former days. And the point he was making is it was really too soon to assess Neville Chamberlain's contribution. But I think those are wonderful words because what we do is exactly that. We take a flickering lamp and we try and stumble along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes. Where were the early hominins living? What were they doing? And so forth. And to revive its echoes and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days. The, nation, the nature of the flickering lamp changes. We don't have the flickering lamps today that I had when I was when I was an undergraduate, we have much more sophisticated flickering lamps, but they're still flickering lamps. So I want to reiterate my thanks to the foundation for their invitation and to Walter for his invitation and to the museum and to the Institute of Advanced Studies and many thanks to you for coming. Professor Wood, this was really and uh, very enjoyable and for myself, which was very interesting because I've worked with C3 and C4 plants and I'd also worked with people in the forest doing inventories some are splitters, some are mergers, so that you never get the, the right number of trees that you have in a, a nectar or whatever area that you have. But uh, now it's time to open for questions. Vamos abertos a perguntas. As palavras são feitas em português, a tradução simultânea. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for our wonderful presentation. And uh, I have a very general question. In your last uh, columns from 2016, there are many homo possibilities, more or less at the same time. And even together with the human species. And then I have a wonder. Have you tried to, to separate the ones that appear in Asia and the ones that appear in Africa? I think this is a very important point, and I have tried to figure out what is really from Asia and what is really from Africa, and if eventually there was some parallel evolution in these different uh, continents. I should have emphasized that the last 30,000 years 
have been an extremely unusual period in our evolutionary history. Because, because for the past 30,000 years, there has only been one hominin on the planet, and that's modern humans. From 30,000 years to four and a half million years, there has always been more than one hominin on the planet. Not necessarily in the same place, but at the same time. The, for, for a long time, it was assumed that modern, that our ancestors in Asia had given rise to modern humans that live in Asia, and our ancestors in Africa had given rise to modern humans that, that live in Africa, and, and, and our ancestors in Europe had given rise to modern humans in Europe. We now know from genetic variation in modern humans, that that cannot be true. Um, the, 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 the modern human genetic variation is most economically explained by a population of modern humans leaving Africa around 80 million years ago. And then that population gave rise to modern humans all over the rest of the world. Now, there were subsequently connection, you know, connections between those populations, and that's, and that's a gross oversimplification, but that is what the, the genetic data mean. So we are all really closely related. Um, and so it is perfectly possible, I think, having said that, that there are species that, of hominins that might have occurred in Africa that didn't occur in Asia, and there might be species that occur in Asia that didn't occur in Africa. But the ancestry, the ultimate ancestry, is such that most of hominin evolution occurred on the African continent. We don't know where it occurred. We know from the fossil evidence that it must have occurred, that it hominins were living in those places, but we don't know they weren't living in other places. Well, but we have looked for them only in Africa. Oh. Oh. We have looked for them only in Africa. So it's, it's completely African-centered research. Well, I think people have looked for, um, but, but it's sort of, it's Afrocentric for a reason that, that we are more closely rela related to the apes that live in Africa than the apes that live in Asia. And Darwin made the point that if you are to seek the ancestors of modern humans, you should seek them in Africa. I don't see any evidence to suggest that he was wrong. Later, you know, I mean, once you get to three million years or two million years, and early hominins left Africa, because I said that modern humans left Africa 80,000 years ago, different species left Africa long before that. But they didn't evolve into modern humans. Modern humans evolved in Africa. Exactly where in Africa, we still don't know. But Modern humans evolved in Africa. As much as you can be certain about anything in biology, modern humans evolved in Africa. Alguma outra pergunta? Uh, building up on that first question, uh, I was wondering. Uh, what is the exact importance of the previous phase of, not, not of hominin evolution, but of hominid evolution that apparently uh, took place uh, in and around the Mediterranean? And uh, some people argue that this, uh, this early phase uh, went to Africa and then, or maybe uh, even while there's, they, were, they were still in the Mediterranean, there was an, an important uh, uh, phase of uh, of uh, adapt adaptation and, and anatomical change that uh, laid the groundwork for, for the actual hominin. So what, what do you think about that? Um, 
that I think, I mean, there isn't any evidence for early hominins outside of Africa before something like Homo erectus. But once, once hominins left Africa, if you can leave, there's absolutely no reason why you can't come back. And so, in other words, they may have done some of their evolution outside of Africa. Um, there is good evidence from the Caucasus of hominins that are sort of, you know, an early form of Homo erectus. Um, and so some of the evolution may have occurred outside of Africa, but it came back into Africa. And then modern humans, you know, the crucible for, for modern humans was Africa. That doesn't mean there weren't sort of genes exchanged, you know, from Africa and outside of Africa. And it always sort of, you know, the concern about, you know, whether it's in Africa or not in Africa, you know, the, you know 300,000 years ago, there wasn't a notice saying you are now leaving Africa. You know. Things may be different. And, you know, and the answer is that, that, that the reasons they left Africa wasn't sort of population pressure because hominins were always in very low levels. I mean, you know, hominins are very rare on the landscape. You should understand hominins are about as common as cheetahs are, you know, and they're damn rare, okay? You know, if you go on a safari, have to pay a lot of money and have a lot of patience to see cheetahs if you're in East Africa. Um, so they were rare on the landscape. So, so the reason that hominins left Africa wasn't population pressure. It's because they were following game or, they, or, or the climate, you know, it was too dry. And so they were sort of constantly looking, you know, for, uh, for the food that they were used to. And they, in a sense, followed the food as changes. I mean, during the most recent glaciations, um, there is there, <laughs> the animals either evolved or they just got the hell out of it when it got too cold. Okay. And so, you know, for example, um, it always, there are, there is evidence of hippopotami in Helsinki. Okay, so it used to be so warm in Helsinki that you could have hippopotami. The, there is evidence of reindeer in fossil sites in North London. So it was so cold that there were reindeer and this was sort of tundra. So what did animals do? Did that cause them to evolve? No, they just said, <laughs> it's too bloody cold here, I'm going south. <laughs> and, then, and, and how do we know that? Because of beetles and because of trees. Beetles, you know, have been around a long time. You know, as Darwin noted, you know, there are a hell of a lot of beetles. What did they do? If you look at fossil sites, as it got colder, the beetles just moved south. When it got warmer, the beetles just moved back up north. They didn't say, oh, well, let's, you know, let's sort of turn into a different sort of beetle that can live in ice. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. Uh, and then we'll go back there when it gets warmer. So I think, you know, we, we, the effect of changes in climate on, on animals, on living things, is really exaggerated. You know, the trees were the same. I mean, you can tell exactly what the climate was by the types of trees you find in fossil sites. Walter. Yes. Well, I disagree with you that Homo erectus was the first hominid to live Africa. We now have amazing evidence of Odoan stone tools in Jordan dated of 2.5 million years. And Homo erectus didn't exist in Africa 2.5 million years ago. Hmm. So, and this also explains the fact that the hominids of Germanys they are not completely Homo erectus. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I see them as a transition between Homo habilis and Homo erectus. So we are defending the idea 
that the first hominid that left Africa was Homo habilis. Well, I mean, you can be racingly certain that things might get earlier, they're not going to get later. So um, at the moment, there is the, uh, the, the fossil evidence for Homo habilis outside of Africa in the form of Homo habilis at Olduvai Gorge just doesn't exist. Just because the fossil evidence doesn't exist doesn't mean that they weren't there. This means that we don't have fossil evidence for it. Um, the behavioral evidence, if there are, if there are, if there are Aldoan artifacts in, in Jordan at two and a half million years, I think is very, you know, is very indicative. But the problem of tying stone tools to hominins is really difficult. And that was brought home to me when we were working you know, on the east side of the the lake and the Turkana came down in their canoes and they had spears and they killed they killed crocodiles and they just bashed stones together and they used sharp flakes which we first find in the fossil record three million years ago. So the Turkana were using artifacts that we first find in the archaeological record three million years ago. Does that mean the Turkana were, you know, I don't know, the Mahabalus? No. Modern humans are smart enough to use whatever works. And if, a, if you need a sharp flake, and that's what you need, that's what you make. You know, you don't sit there for half a day making, you know, an Ashley and a hand axe just because I can. You know, you, you, you use what you need. Uh, hello, thanks, Professor, for the talk. Uh, first, I would like to ask: uh, so far as carbon isotopes and uh, and and our dentition go, uh, first, how long ago can carbon be informative about our diet and our habitat? And second, uh, what does evidence about carbon isotopes in the dentition suggest about our place and environment of evolution? The and. I'm not an expert on, st on stable isotopes, so I'm the last one to explain to you how this works. Um, but they, they, they don't tell us what exactly was eaten. They tell us what sorts of things were eaten. And um, so it doesn't tell us exactly what was put into people's mouths, but it does suggest that if you have predominantly C3 diet, which is, which is the case for chimpanzees. If you look at stable isotopes in chimpanzees, it's mainly C3 because they feed on C3 vegetation and they feed on C3 fruits and that, that sort of dominates in their diet. We know what they're eating because we can go and see them doing it. We know what their stable isotopes were because we can look at the teeth of dead chimpanzees. For the hominins, we can only look at their teeth. We can't see exactly what they were ingesting, but we can make predictions in general terms. But the reason I was saying that probably Homo agaster, Homo erectus, was not eating the grass that I think that I think Paranthropus boisei was eating, because their jaws and teeth are completely unsuited for that. And if that's what they were doing, then you know that was a really dumb thing to do. So I suspect they get there for their C4 signal from ingesting meat of animals that were eating grass. I'm not sure I've answered your question, but, but I think if it was about how this method works and when it was first used, I think you're asking the wrong question, uh, the wrong person. I'm just trying to think, I think the C4 thing, you know, was essentially developed in the 1980s. We have time Excuse for me. two questions. Nós temos tempo para mais duas perguntas. Yes? Excuse me for the question. I'm Sergio Petrilli. I'm a sample from the community. I'm not in the field, okay? I'm a doctor, pediatrician, working in cancer in children. 
And I learned today that definitely the human being came from the apples, from the monkeys, okay? That's the point that you give. Could you just make a comment about the relationship or if there is any questions between religion and science in this area, please? The, the, I mean, I think, well, firstly, thank you for coming and also thank you for being probably a very good pediatrician. But the, um, the, it's important to realize that since the most recent common ancestor of modern humans and chimpanzees and bonobos, there's been a lot of evolution on the modern human side. There's also been evolution on the chimpanzee and bonobo side. So the most recent common ancestor is, I know you know perfectly well, it's not a chimpanzee or a bonobo. It is an ancestor of chimpanzee and bonobo. To answer your question about how all this is affected by people's religious beliefs. I think you're answering the wrong person. You're asking the wrong person because my religious beliefs are, are, are not that well developed. When I'm asked to talk about this to people who do not sort of believe in evolution, the point I make is that God, in her infinite wisdom, came up with the idea of evolution. Because otherwise, God would have to be, be looking at every living creature and adjusting that creature to make sure that they could you know, exist in different environments. That's a 24-hour, you know, 24-7 sort of job. And so God thought, wow, why don't we come up with natural selection? So I don't have to stay awake all night making all these changes. The animals actually make them for themselves. And it would seem to me that if I was a religious person and if I could link natural selection to God, I would think that's a very smart thinking. But that, that argument doesn't go down sort of terribly well. I'm not sure, does that, does that help you? Oh, I'm, yeah, I mean, religion is, there are sort of Darwinian, you know, there are evolutionary biologists who study religion. And it's clear that religion must confer some genetic advantage because there is a lot of it about. And it must confer some genetic advantage. It probably gives people society, it gives them a you know, group that they can that they can interact with, but that's not, you know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist interested in. The last question. So thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm interested in the first question you proposed, the how many taxa are they? And I wanted to know, how do you think would it be a good way to solve that question? I mean, should we be using uh, living species, morphological variation as a pattern, maybe chimpanzees, modern humans, or even an average value for all living great apes? Or that is a question we are not going to solve? Well, I don't think it's a question we're going to solve. I think it's a challenge that we can be less ignorant about. We could do some modeling. We could try and model what would happen to a taxon over a million years if it was subjected to various sorts of climate change, for which we already have evidence in the past. So you could do some modeling and you could try and sort of take variation. But of course, the problem with variation in modern human populations, you know, sort of skeletal collections in museums and skeletal collections of chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas in museums, is that those collections have been accumulated over maybe a couple of hundred years. We're talking about evolutionary history in terms of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. So how do you translate the variation you see in a skeletal collection in a museum to a million years and across 
a large time range. That's the challenge. And that is the challenge that I've been thinking about since 1966, and it's a challenge I'm going to hand on to young people. Thank you again, uh, Professor uh, Bernard Wood, for this uh, marvelous talk. It's been a long time since I've seen so many people in this auditorium. So uh, you are really uh, brought a lot of people, people that some of them are not from the academy, just to discuss and to, to, to learn of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Antes, antes de uh, terminarmos, eu tenho uh, dois avisos uh, para dar. Se pudessem projetar os slides da, uh, das próximas duas conferências dentro desse ciclo. Então, é um, então uh, no próximo dia 27 de outubro, nós vamos ter a conferência pela doutora Laura Pereira, que é da Universidade de Johannesburg, África do Sul, e ela vai estar falando sobre as mudanças transformativas que nós precisamos fazer para conseguir viver, viver em harmonia com a natureza. É uma grande colega minha, trabalhei muito tempo com ela, tenho certeza que vai ser uma palestra das mais interessantes. E, é, encerrando o ciclo desse ano, no dia 24 de novembro, nós vamos ter raízes que emergem entrelaçamentos entre arte e ciência, pela Rosana Paulino, da Escola de Comunicações e Artes da, da USP. É, também tenho certeza que será é, extremamente interessante, porque essa é uma das coisas que a gente vem tentando fazer neste ciclo de palestras. E se vocês puderem passar o próximo slide. Também na organização de duas escolas uh, interdisciplinares que acontecem uh, uma no início de novembro, de 5 a 8 de novembro, que é de Ciências Exatas e Naturais, Engenharias e Medicina, e uh, vai acontecer uh, no, no Imbu, né, Imbu das Artes, e a segunda escola, que é uma escola de humanidade, ciências sociais e artes, que também vai acontecer no mesmo hotel, mas no período de 10 a 13 de dezembro. Para essa segunda escola, chama a atenção que as inscrições estão abertas. A primeira, elas já se encerraram. O professor Bafa e eu temos a dura tarefa agora de fazer a seleção uh, dos inscritos, selecionar os 60 uh, participantes que vão estar fazendo. Então, é, essa é uma tentativa que a FAPES tem é, feito de é, reunir, de, de se tornar cada vez mais interdisciplinar. A nossa ideia para o ano que vem é juntar essas duas escolas numa escola única, interdisciplinar, que envolva é, as diversas ciências, as humanidades, as artes, e é, tentar trazer tudo para um, um universo único. Eu agradeço demais a presença de vocês, volto a dizer o que eu falei para o professor Bernard, há muito tempo a gente não vê esse auditório da FAPESP tão uh, cheio para uma palestra, e eu espero que a gente continue vendo vocês nos próximos eventos. Muito obrigado a todos e a todas. Obrigado.